Okay, so I guess you're all quiet. We'll, we'll start. I want to see you. Is that what you mean? Uh, and there yes. has a few more things on it. Back in the back of the have to see that. The, the goal of this meeting is more, more to have a discussion. <coughs> this is like the highlight of my week. Yay. Yeah, yeah. It's been that kind of week. It's, it's yeah. that bad. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. But okay. You, you're not. So allowed, you're not allowed to talk. About yeah, I, I was wondering if we get through this without there's stuff leaking it down. Hey, I'm right next to NATO. So, uh, so the reason we're having this, we're, uh, as you know, starting to think about revisions to the MCP. And this is uh, this topic, uh, human hazards, is something that has been keeping your eyes for a while. Uh, I think we've all, certainly in the DEB, have had the experience of, of going and explaining um, to, to people, let's say residents, that you have a human hazard, you have tetrachloroethylene, they're at elevated levels that based on our calculations, a human hazard, two hour notification, and we're going to start. The response action, and part of the uh, result of that is that the residents feel anxious. Anxious. <laughs> uh, and particularly, and then you say, "Well, it's it's imminent hazard, but you're not going to die immediately because, because this what well, we're on. <laughs> I, it's not well, ideally. <laughs> It's based on five-year exposure and you know, COVID denial. So, so there's a difficulty in messaging, and that's something that we certainly realized a long time ago um, in calling in using the term imminent hazards uh, in general. Uh, that it, it, tend, it does tend to work people, and, and you know, perhaps right this year, in, in the correct circumstances, it's, it's good to get them worked up. So, kind of the, the what I wanted to do here is, is have a discussion about kind of the, how even in the hazards are looked at, how they use the implications of it, uh, how they fit in with the definitions, and what are the possibilities for kind of making the, what we do uh, align better with the terminology and the definition of the uh, And with kind of some parameters that I'd like to set ahead of time beforehand. Kind of my view of this uh, is particularly, particularly for this person trying to expose a little under five year exposure. That that is, in my view, doesn't line up with the definition of the On the other hand, uh, the, if somebody is being exposed to elevated levels of a carcinogen, department is, uh, is comfortable with requiring accelerated response actions for that. So, what put out here right at the beginning, this is not a discussion about how we stop looking at the potential short-term or shorter-term effects of exposures to elevated levels of carcinogens and just kind of dismissing it as we'll get to it eventually. What, what I kind of forever as I like to say is we are still interested in having uh, faster action if somebody is being exposed, whether it's uh, cancer risk or non-cancer risk, if somebody is being exposed and the elevated concentrations, uh, we don't want the system to play out where you have, oh, I have six years to deal with this, to get a permanent solution. You know, I'll wait for the phase two, you know, I'll wait for the phase three and phase four, and you know, eventually we'll stop that. We want to know that earlier, we want action earlier. The question that I would put to you is that, like that discussion on the ground, is if we, if we don't call it an imminent hazard, then what are the options for identifying these conditions what are the options for having accelerated response actions? What they should they look like? What should they look like? What are the time frames that would be appropriate for it? And how would it fit in if they're imminent hazards and uh, substantial hazards? Because I can't that's kind of where I'm thinking about going. Uh, 
are sprinkled throughout the MCP. And the other thing I want people to think about is kind of what are the other implications if we take it out one, one category and put it in another category. And are we comfortable with that? Or do we, uh, how do we want it to play out? The end, the bottom line for me is that the actual actions that we see in the face of elevated levels of exposure to something like, say, tetrachloroethylene, uh, should not be that different from what we see now. But it might work slightly differently. Uh, because something different. Uh, perhaps take some of the imminent pressure off, describe it slightly differently. But uh, more or less, I think we would want the same kind of accelerated response actions. So, um, I mean, the, the, the definitions that I put out there, um, you're going back to, I, you know, 1903 or so, uh, one, of, one of the reasons the Nancy is here for more us, and I was involved in that as well back then, the, one of the reasons we chose a five-year exposure for evaluating carcinogens is because the the studies that the slow factors and uh, cancer potentials are probably based on all lifetime exposures. And the, the thought was that the shortest time period that would really be consistent with that lifetime exposure, typically or lagging, uh, would be a five year exposure. That calculating cancer risk based upon a, a two month exposure, or a three month exposure, or a one year exposure uh, had too many uncertainties. And, Models necessarily support uh, a linear cancer risk associated with that. Uh, so, lacking the ability to actually appropriately evaluate a, say, six month exposure to our carcinogen, that little confidence that the number that would come out of that calculation actually would be meaningful, uh, we looked at the five year exposure. So, that, that, that's kind of the, you know, that's the basis for why we did that. That's made the time to kind of rethink how it works. Okay, can I ask you a question? So, um, and you know, I, I hear everything you're saying. I mean, I guess I've always thought an imminent hazard should be something that's actually an acute health risk, um, something that really has the potential to cause what I would consider, you know, a very short term health hazard. And um, I think with the CEP definition, you're capturing the situations of concern that maybe we don't want someone being exposed, for example, to elevated levels of carcinogen. But a CEP, so in a residential situation, I think you're actually covered there because a CEP triggers an IRA, okay? So to me, the whole that I guess I'm wondering if you're thinking about is for the non-residential situation, which is not part of the CEP SRM paradigm, um, and you know, you might still have, you might still want to look at worker risks over something more than a, an acute time period, um, that maybe you set up something like an accelerated response condition that doesn't have some of the, um, I think, anxiety-inducing words and rhetoric that, that, you know, can cause more problems and be helpful, um, but still would be a way that DEP could maybe capture things that I think could fall through the cracks. I mean, to me, that's like the only scenario I can think of that you don't have, you don't really have it. It's that other media. media. That's right. So it's also yeah. limit your discussion only focus on the yeah, that's, that's right. It's that's right. Oh, yeah, that's right. So, that's right. so you need yes. something that can capture other, oh, the residential, right. uh, other residential and even and commercial and other and situations. situations. So, so CEP yeah. gets you school and Day -care, Day -care, whatever, gets you yeah. all of those what would have been in hazards that maybe call something else. Or water. Right, or water. Yeah. But what you would lose are commercial, yeah. short-term yeah. risk, yeah. like if you call it a substantial hazard. Which I think is good logic because that gets you that gets you all of these things. Shorter term risk, but you lose indoor air for commercial, and you lose all other media for any receptor. But you could call those substantial hazards, but then a substantial hazard would have to trigger um, 
some kind of response back. But it doesn't, substantial hazard isn't necessarily a short term, the way it's defined right now. Mm -hmm. It can be, because remember it goes back to the, the time period. Where but it's paid. current, which is it's current uses, a concern. But if you're getting at, like, I'm concerned that what happens if there's if there is a really high cancer risk at five years due to exposure, the substantial hazard, you know, it just might, the way it kind of falls in the system, you don't have to do accelerated response actions. No, you'd have to change the rate. Yeah. Do so, but you have to call it, you need an accelerated rate. Really high levels of, you know, phosphate and soil. Right, yeah. so yeah. that would be, we would need people to evaluate that as a, you need somebody to do a substantial hazard evaluation instead of an imminent hazard evaluation early on. There'd but current conditions. Be, right, well, by definition, right? That's what the term would yeah. mean, right? And then, so like for this framework to work, then a substantial hazard would trigger some kind of accelerated response.